Okay. All right. So, yay, we're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, viewers. <laughs> we are Pixel Pop Maid Cafe. Uh, we are a gaming centric maid cafe. Uh, we are also a group of gamers who have been around the community since we were young, and we wanted to share our past and present gaming experiences. So that's what this panel is all about. Um, and this panel blossomed from a discussion on recent gatekeeping between older and younger fans. And we at Pixel Pop firmly believe that no generation is truly better and that each one influences the gaming community in special ways. So also just keep in mind that this panel will include some spoilers uh, and because of our discussion. Um, the series that we'll be talking about are World of Warcraft, Yakuza, Pokemon, Final Fantasy, and then maybe some other things sprinkled in. So throughout the panel, feel free to weigh in with your thoughts and ask questions as well. And we'll be able to answer specific questions at the end. So let's introduce ourselves. Uh, I am Made Cream, and my first console was the GameCube. And I believe my first game was Sonic Adventure 2. Um, so let's move on to Made Mina. <laughs> I am Made Mina, and my first console was a Nintendo DS, 3DS, I think. And my mm. first game was Pokemon X and Y, I believe. <laughs> All right, Maid Suzume. Hello, this is Maid Suzume. Uh, my first console, I believe, is the Sega Mega Drive, also known as the Sega Genesis in the U.S. And Maid Chio. Hi, this is Maid Chio. My first console, if you call it, was a PC, and I used to love playing all those browser flash games. And Maid Digi. Hi, I'm Maid Digi. My first console was the Nintendo DS, and my first game was. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, ow. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, again, Digi, sorry. <laughs> oh, did it cut out? Okay. Hi, yeah, I'm Digi. Uh, my first console was the Nintendo DS, and my first game was Pokemon Diamond. Mm. All right. So that's all of us. Uh, and we have way more made also, if you want to check us out. <laughs> it picks up all Make Cafe on basically every social media. Um, but let's start with our first topic, which would be led by Mina and Digi. <laughs> so first up, we're going to be talking about Nintendo and our experiences with the company and the games that we've played. Um, personally, for me, Nintendo was like my gateway into the gaming realm. Um, I knew nothing about video games until Pokemon, and I found out about Pokemon through a friend group at the YMCA Child Care. <laughs> um, <laughs> my friends would like pretend to be Pokemon and be like, Oh, you should be Piplup! And I was like, what's a Piplup? So I ended up getting a DS and playing Pokemon Diamond. And, you know, after that, I was just obsessed with Pokemon. Now I play all the games. I got into the card games. It was awesome. Um, yeah, how about you, Mina? When I was younger, I had to be about middle school or something. And my friends used to play Pokemon all the time. And I wanted my own DS, my own play with Pokemon. So of course I got one, and I transferred over, and now I'm stuck with this baby. <laughs> yeah, so that's definitely a cool thing. Um, plus, I think it's really interesting how Pokemon has kind of changed throughout the years. Because I remember I started, Pokemon, Pokemon was really pixelated, like we still had little pixel character bases. And mm -hmm. throughout like the first couple of years of me playing the games, the models were changed to 3D models because of the 3DS. Um, I still miss the pixel bases for Pokemon. Me too. I, I really do. Especially <laughs> um, Pokemon Black and White because they had the pixel bases move and it was just yes. so... Oh my god. Yeah, right? It was great. So also, good. In that game. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, Another thing about Nintendo I want to say is, after Pokemon, it kind of like led me to play more games like Legend of Zelda, the Kirby games, uh, Mario games even, which I think it's funny because whenever I ask my friends, like, what was your first Nintendo game, they'd always be like, oh, it was Super Mario, and be like, what? <laughs> Why is it Mario? <laughs> but that makes sense, because it's the character mascot for Nintendo, so I just think it's really interesting how all these different franchises within Nintendo kind of like bring it all together and you experience it as a whole, I guess. Yeah. Um, I guess another thing to add also with the Pokemon franchise though is Pokemon Go. 
Uh, that was a thing that happened a couple years back, and I remember it getting really public. And it was interesting to see all these people that wouldn't normally play video games get into something video game-like. Um, I really think the the teams, like Mystic, uh, what was the red one? Uh, <laughs> I forget. Valor? Valor. Valor? 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 Yeah. Oh, in, in, oh you are in, shaming in, Valor right now, I'm huh? sorry, Valor. Mm. I'm just all the way. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I definitely wanted to talk about like how those like teams started a community to get more people involved in the game, which I find very interesting, especially for what we're talking about today with gatekeeping in the gaming community. Um, I want to say Pokemon Go really helped keep gatekeeping out for Pokemon specifically because these communities were so welcoming, but also so against each other. It just started a really fun competition between everybody playing the game, and I really feel like that helped to get more people into Pokemon that wouldn't have usually played it. Mm hmm Yeah, for sure. It was so fun. It was like, also, I remember, like, people would be like, paint the town blue or paint the town red, especially yeah. with the gym battles. Oh my god. <laughs> Everyone would be um, out. <laughs> I, remember... I remember when I first started playing, nobody was Team Instinct. Everyone was either Mystic <laughs> or Valor Beast. The, like, the tension between those two was so strong. <laughs> it was so hard to claim gems around where I lived because people would just keep going at it with Mystic and Valor. It was like, oh my goodness, we're just over here chilling. <laughs> I remember going to a park once, like uh, I was on lunch break at work. I went to a park just like looking down my phone, and uh, <laughs> and I saw somebody else who's looking down their phone, right? And we all both like it was almost like script. We both look up and then we made eye contact like right at the same time. And then I just like said, Team Instinct. And then he looked at me and said, Nod. And I was like, Nice. And we kind of like shake each other's hand and it would just like go by our own way. That was a really cool moment. It was, it was, it was really lovely. It was just such a great way to make friends, I feel. Um, because again, it's like you feel like you're part of the community when you're part of the team. And like you get that kind of bond, like, Hey, I'm Team Instinct, you're Team Instinct. Look at us. Who would have thought? <laughs> Wait, so what teams were, were you guys all on? Like, I was Valor, so... You were, I was I'm Valor. so sorry I disrespected you! I <laughs> forgot <laughs> the game, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> so we had no Mystic in here? I'm a Mystic. Oh, you're a Mystic. Okay, there we go. We got all three. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, it was really... It, it was funny, though, because it's like you had half... Uh, like I guess like people that didn't know Pokemon like when they went outside I remember distinctly I, I went out to a town center and then everyone was on their phone and then like I hear some adults like gosh look at this uh, look at this new generation everyone just looks at their phones I was like oh, you don't understand we're all connecting to each other because Wait. there's a Pikachu right there <laughs> I remember I probably went outside more that summer than I ever had in life. Yeah. <laughs> it was just great Plus, I found it really cute how parents would take, like, their kids out to play Pokemon Go. Like, the ones that couldn't drive yet, you know? It was like a fun family bonding activity. Yeah. Really nice. <laughs> um, let's see, I have some more talking points. Um... So, I mean, we can also talk about other Nintendo franchises. Like, we definitely have Zelda. I'm really excited for the new Breath of the Wild 2 coming out in a couple years. Um, the Hyrule Warriors game that's coming out looks really interesting. Because oh we're going to get yeah. a more story to behind what happened in the first yeah. Breath of the Wild. So that's going to be really cool to, to see. Um, I also find it really, really neat that we get to play as the champions this time. Get mm -hmm. to learn more about them. <laughs> Also, um, I think Mina mentioned how Nintendo helped them segue into Vocaloid. So if you'd yeah. like to talk about that. Yeah, I have the game right here. It's really, really old. It's like from early 2010s of Hatsune Miku, Project DX, Project Mirai DX. Oh. <laughs> it was like my first ever encounter with Hatsune Miku. <laughs> and it just starts um, started out to be a little obsession, I think. That's what people would call it. 
website. It was fun having little Miku on here. Also a beat game, if that. Mm. And also spreading my gaming franchise far, like beat games and stuff, specifically. I think that definitely loops back to how Nintendo is such a good starter game company for a lot of people because I mean, it got you into Vocaloid, it got me into Pokemon, and it just kind of like, I feel is a really good way to start with your video game experience. Anybody else have like any Nintendo games that kind of started them? Hmm. I mean, I was, yeah, Pokemon when, when it was like still pixels. I still re like, uh, I wasn't really the Game Boy generation, but my sister was. So I would, uh, that was like kind of my experience with that. But like my first experience was definitely uh, the Game Boy Advance, which that one was in color. <laughs> Apparently the ones before were black and white. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fun that you brought up your siblings because me and my brother, we would always like fight over which of the Pokemon games we would get based on the <laughs> legendary box art. Oh I yeah, like that's yeah. The biggest thing that happens to a lot of siblings <laughs> that enjoy the Pokemon games. Like, okay, well you got to pick this one last time. So now it's my turn. I get to choose the legendary I want. Mm -hmm. But it's also interesting to see like the games that I started out with and then the games that he plays now. Mm -hmm. uh, because I started with Pokemon Diamond, and he started with Sun and Moon, so there wasn't the pixels anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It was all modeled, and um, even I feel like the world exploring was a little different, because it was more like an open world, kind of. Mm. The yeah. other games, you just kind of get your screen, and then it's kind of you don't have a camera moving around. Mm -hmm. So I find that really interesting to think about, because it's not like we have a 10-year difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's literally over the span of like four or three years and yeah. everything changed so much mm. so it's really cool to think about like also the people that started with red and red and green and how like where they are now it's like i can't imagine mm. starting with the first game and then seeing how much the franchise has changed throughout yeah. all of them it's like definitely with times like that, it's like I can understand why sometimes there is a sentiment of like, you know, like the older generation was better because like we had like, you know, like our moving, oh, like some people say with the moving water. animations were better or like, you know, like with the pixel uh, animations, some people say that's better than like the 3D animations now. And it's like, that's, that I feel like that's what starts the whole like old versus new kind of debate. And it's like, people are valid in whichever opinion or whichever game they want to do, but it's also like we're still in the same series in the same community, so <laughs> it's like there's there's almost no point in like fighting each other because it's not like technically we can control what they put out. <laughs> exactly, and it's also like I understand having an emotional attachment to a certain generation because for me I love Gen Four in the Sinnoh region so much, mm -hmm. but it's also like we shouldn't tell everybody else that started with like maybe gen 6 or gen 7 that they're not allowed to enjoy pokemon because they didn't play a certain generation mm -hmm. um, like you're allowed to hold a sentimental attachment to one of the gens but when it gets to a point where it's like you play another game and you think everybody else that plays that game just isn't valid for liking it it's like well let people enjoy things yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just simple let people enjoy things <laughs> Right. Okay, so let's transition to the next topic. Any other uh, closing thoughts, though, from Mina and Digi, though? <laughs> Pokemon's the best. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much, D Digi and Mina. So my name's Chio. I'll be talking about my experience with World of Warcraft. Sorry, switching the dock. Okay, so I've, I've been playing World of Warcraft since late vanilla all the way up to, like, Legion, so... I don't have as much of the generational experience, but uh, my my experience was that even though I present as a female in real life, uh, when I played World of Warcraft, I exclusively used male characters and used voice changers for a long time and c didn't really feel like I identified with a lot of the female characters. And despite this initial disconnect I felt, uh, the, dis the discussions and debates these characters sparked led me to critically examine my own attitudes about gender and how we interact in virtual spaces. Mm. So starting off as a 
brand new WoW player. Oh yeah, anytime, please interrupt me. I'm not like a, so a sociology major. I'm just talking. <laughs> Uh, so starting off as a brand new WoW character, like I had a very very stereotypical first character, a female night elf hunter. That's like what everyone wants to play when they first start off with World of Warcraft, right? And it was all fun and cool, like exploring the world, doing like the little double spinny jump thing. That was really cool, but I guess it didn't start off super aggressive. But I, I would get comments like, "Hey, are, are you are you a real girl? What's your MySpace? Are you single?" And oh. of course, at first, oh. I just kind of brush it off. Yeah, right? <laughs> I was like seven. I was like, oh my god, what? Oh no! It's even worse. <laughs> yeah, so like at first, I just brush it off like, oh, wh whatever, weirdos on the internet, right? But then when I started doing dungeons more and raiding, we had to use voice chat, like TeamSpeak, Vent, and all that. And that's when I noticed a um, different reaction I got when I had a female voice. Uh, I noticed two two main reactions. The first one was very negative and critical. Like, of course, everyone gets frustrated with, your, with, either, with each other in games, right? And talking sh pretty normal, expected in online communities. But I, I noticed that when I had a female voice, a lot of my mistakes would be attributed to my gender. Like, oh, you don't even know how to play, like, GM, or, oh, this is why this is why we don't let girls tank and all that, you're right? Like, cool, like, okay, I, I know I f but it has nothing to do with that. That made me kind of like sad. On the other end of the spectrum, um, using. Sorry. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, some people would react kind of overly protective. An example I got from my friend Don last night was when he corrected a female player and someone jumped on him for treating her like um, poop, uh, even mm -hmm. though he was giving real constructive criticism. And I feel like this other, this other reaction would breed resentment towards a female player from other players who might feel like, oh, like, she's getting special treatment because she she's a girl and all that, right? Mm. And at the end of the day, like, I, I just ended up using male characters and a voice changer to make me sound like a guy because I just wanted to play games the same as everyone else, right? My experiences reflect what's been observed on a larger scale. A study conducted by Kuzinov and Rose demonstrated that even after controlling for message content and skill level, Players using female voices received three times more negative comments than male voices or no voice at all, but also got more DMs and friend requests, right? H have you guys noticed any of this in your gaming experiences? Mm. Mm. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, when it comes to the voice changer, I can relate not, like, because of the gender, but definitely relate to identity issue, because um, I am an Asian immigrant, so I have a little bit of accent in, um, you know, in my English. So there's one time where I was playing PUBG, um, which is, you know, uh, player known battleground. And uh, I like to play in a team setting and I was trying to communicate with my team. And um, I want to say this one of the most, if not the most unpleasant experience I've ever had in video game is when they noticed that I was, you know, Asian with the accent, they started to like team kill me, then revive me and then team kill me right away in a way that is like, like it's it's pretty much the most violent interactions without getting physical and just because of essentially what you mentioned is the um the voice chat like i wish that like at that moment i become very very subconscious my accent like i don't like like i wish there's a way to get rid of it because i really do want to enjoy video games just like anybody else um but i feel like it's also related to the issue where you talk about like you know, identity when it comes to using voice chat, just pe people kind of notice something different about you just because the way you speak, because of your voice. Um, so yeah, in, in, in a weird sense, I really definitely relate to you when it comes to using a voice changer. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I feel like in online spaces, like what people can see from us is so limited. Like you just see the avatar and the voice. So, so people will hmm. put take one thing, jump on it and stereotype you based on that. And that can be really hurtful sometimes. Mm -hmm. True. I mean, also with like, uh, you know, just like female gamers in general, like, you know, there's still such like a stigma against it, like you're saying. It's like, uh, even in uh, like, I I'll get into uh, my Yakuza topic later, of course, but like, uh, a lot, of, I see uh, it's common, um, not only in the Yakuza series and other fandoms that uh, a lot of uh, gamers would say, oh, this, this fandom is getting ruined by all the female gamers or whatever because it's like they're interpreting something more they like you know they're liking a character 
um, for how he looks, and they're like, oh, you just like him because he looks, like, sexy or whatever. And it's like, you don't appreciate the game. But it's like, well, <laughs> you could do both, or you could do one or the other, so... It's yeah. like, why is it just the female gamers? <laughs> right, right. Plus, I think having discussions about what you think about the characters is super important for, for the community. Like, for example, um, in, in the Blizzard universes, uh, I had a lot of trouble at first relating to a lot of the female characters. Like, for example, Kerrigan from StarCraft II, she, she's at first presented as a really powerful enemy, but then, like, I felt like in StarCraft II, she's kind of turned into a vulnerable damsel in distress. Um, like, in Heart of the Swarm, she kind of flip-flops between, like, chasing after two men, being with Raynor, and then getting revenge on Minx. And I just felt like she wasn't relatable anymore because her actions felt irrational and her motivations were super... Oh, Cream. Oh, welcome back. Mm -hmm. Right, oh. so I feel like characters are so much... Ooh. Sorry, we good? Yep, we good. Okay, sorry. So sorry. I feel like characters are so much more interesting when you can understand where they're coming from, why they're making the choices they're making, and you feel invested in their outcomes, right? Kerrigan, in this example, becomes what Anne Stickney refers to as a barnacle character, or a character whose entire existence is dependent on wrapped and wrapped around the existence of another. While this definitely isn't something that happens to exclusively female characters, we see this a lot in Blizzard's writing, where characters with amazing potential are relegated to just being a romantic interest. But of course, not everything in my World of Warcraft experience was negative. A, a really good example of a character kind of unbarnacly was Jaina Proudmoore, in my opinion. She starts off as like the typical like, ooh, like, nice princess and a love interest for Arthas. But when he descends into madness and becomes the Lich King, like, she, she's hurt, of course, that's normal, but she doesn't just give up and end her story right there. In Wrath of the Lich King, she plays a major role in defeating the Lich King along with the players. And of course, she's played with regret and insecurity about the role she played in Arthas becoming the Lich King. And in the end, when we finally defeat him, she bursts into tears. Mm. However, like, Caring about Arthas was not her only motivation or defining characteristic, and she has continued to be in the WoW universe, have meaningful interactions with the rest of the characters and play a major role. And like growing up, I really hated this expectation I felt that female characters had that no matter how powerful and influential you may be, your ultimate fate is to just find a partner, settle down, and then the universe is like, oh, okay, you like fulfilled your job, just go sit in the corner as like an NPC, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, I started seeing some discussions like in-game on the forums about how, how other people felt the same. I was like, oh, like, that's cool. Like, this is not a thing that's absolutely set in stone. There are other opinions and options out there that we could talk about. And acknowledging and discussing issues you might have with popular characters can be really uncomfortable because, of course, people are going to get heated. Not everyone agrees with you. Everyone has different opinions, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it shows a appreciation and desire for female characters to be treated the same as their, male, as their male counterparts in the crafting of video game stories, right? A male character is not defined by just being a male. He has a believable backstory, reasons for existing, and goals to strive for. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I was like, with uh, Kerrigan, um, I got cut out <laughs> for some reason, but yeah, with Kerrigan, um, when I was rewatching, uh, actually the compilation, um, when I was preparing for this this panel, uh, I was reminded of how you know she was very she was like so determined like from the first game, it was like really crazy how conniving she was. Like at the, I think there was like one moment where she like it, even the player believed that she was good like for a moment. Like oh she my god, yeah. Totally, <laughs> like she was like, see, yeah, we have to kill what uh, the Overlord or I forget what his name was but like we have to kill the overlord we have to work together and you work together and then she's like thanks for killing him now i'm gonna take over like that was yeah that, oh my god that was great that was lovely so it's like that kind of like characterization like it's like a female character doesn't have to be like morally good like you're saying like they could be an interesting complex character that like you hate but like you love at the same time because they're like that way exactly so, exactly yeah. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, like, my, my experiences are kind of limited on the generational aspect, because I've been playing since the beginning, so you wanted to talk about Yakuza and the influence of starting mm. at different generations, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'll... Bye -bye. 
So yeah, let's talk about Yakuza. Thank you for sharing your experience also, Chio. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'd like to switch gears into a recent fandom I got into, which is Yakuza, or Ryuga Gotoku, which translates to Like a Dragon. And I recently started streaming Yakuza 0 for Pixel Pop, um, but I did finish uh, Yakuza 0 through 6 already. Um, and actually, I finished 6 like literally maybe two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, I'm also familiar with Ishin, thanks to the translators on YouTube. So yeah, like I, I really trudged through all of Yakuza. Um, and Yakuza is a beat 'em up action adventure game, and it centers around the ex Yakuza Kiryu Kazuma, and he deals with various issues involving his old Yakuza family, which is called the Tojo Clan, um, through every game. And if anyone is familiar with this recent trend, this is also the source for the recent Baka Mitai meme or the Dame Dame meme. <laughs> So my experience in the Yakuza fandom is still fairly new, but I'm not new to the fandom space at all. I've probably been in fandom for like over a decade, maybe like, I don't know, maybe like 14 years or so. Um, so I've seen how various fandoms work and almost all of them are pretty much like same in the end. Uh, so, so far I really love being part of the Yakuza fandom because I mean, in the first place, fandom to me is about connecting with people and like finding a space for myself that I can express my love through anyway and I have so much love for this series um and like I express it through like you know character analysis artwork cosplay stuff like that um and I connect with people that also do the same thing um and I would say that since I played through all the games in just two months uh, I definitely don't have the same experience as those who have been waiting for like years and years for like Kiryu's story to finally come to an end so basically, I would still call myself a newbie, but I like to bring up the uh, fun of fandom obtaining new fans and fostering a place that welcomes both new and old fans. So for a bit of history, uh, Yakuza 1 and 2 were released in 2005 and 2006 in Japan. And then for the English release, it was released in 2006 and 2008. And then now recently, Yakuza 0 was released in 2015, Yakuza Kiwami in 2016, and then Yakuza Kiwami in 2017 for Japan. For the English releases, uh, Zero and Kiwami both released in 2017, and then Kiwami 2 released in 2018. So, I primarily highlight these two games because, as a recent fan, I observed the term the Kiwami crowd <laughs> being passed around. This refers to fans that have only played these three games, so Zero through Kiwami 2. Um, and Zero through Kiwami 2 are, are available on Steam, while 3 through 6 are not, um, and Ishin is still uh, doesn't have an English localization. Um, there are several reasons, there are several factors as to why Zero through Kiwami 2 are the most talked about, and the biggest is that they're the most recent remakes. And the original Yakuza 1 sold over 200,000 units in Japan in 2005, and they also shipped well, almost 350,000 units as well. Uh, and Ki Yakuza Kiwami 1 and 0 were the top two best-selling games in Japan during their release week, and it reached best-selling new releases of the month on Steam. So they were very successful. Um, but also, Yakuza 0, the prequel to all the existing games of the series, was very, very well received. As for June, uh, like as of June 2015, Yakuza 0 sold over 500,000 copies in Japan and Chinese-speaking regions of Asia. And then the UK, Yakuza reached the eighth top selling game in a week in January. And because of this positive reception to Yakuza Kiwami and Yakuza Zero, Kiwami 2 was set into works. So back to the whole Kiwami crowd thing, it seems silly that we're looking down on the fans that are definitely reviving the fandom with a new and fresh vigor. Like it's been almost a decade since they made the first, very first game. And they have new graphics, new gameplay, new mechanics. Uh, I believe they have even like new sub stories and stuff like that. So, and then now we have Yakuza Zero, which sets a recurring character and ranked number one as a fan favorite character as a playable protagonist, who is Majima Goro. And this in itself gave something new to the entire fandom, and it shed new light on Majima as a character because honestly, like, you don't see him very much uh, after Zero, like, or at least he doesn't have as big as a role because he's not the central playable character. Like even in six, I got maybe what, like five minutes of screen time? Not even, I got like a minute of screen time. I was so sad, <laughs> but yeah. So like this, even those that became, that like began with the 2005 Yakuza 1 received a new experience. And so Suzume, I know that you also like Yakuza. So which game did you start with? And what was like your take on Majima at first? 
Mm. So it was really, really interesting. Like Zero was also my first Yakuza game in the series. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, I've always kind of like have some interest in the whole series. So I read up like analysis in the previous like um, uh, games before mm -hmm. Zero, and my um, reception of Maji was like, "Wow, this guy's crazy. This guy people call him <laughs> a bad dog, right?" But then into what was it? I think it's chapter what three. Was it chapter three? Yeah, chapter like six? Yeah. switch. Yeah, that, and it's like Banjo is like jacked up with suit, very elegant, comes in, avoiding using violence to resolve um, <laughs> the situation at hand. I was just absolutely intrigued by this entire concept. Like, wow, what happened? Like, how did he mm. come to be this really just mad dog? Like the nickname Mad Dog. Um, what have happened? What have transpired? And that was like one of the coolest moments in like any video games I've ever played. But then at the same time, mm. I realized that what if Zero was like your first game ever, like the mm. ever heard of like Yakuza as a series. They would think about, oh, Majima is like, wow, this gentleman, you know? But they never know that in literally six other games, he carry a sh like a short sword, like a knife around, just stab people <laughs> to like, like basically he'll kick anybody's ass that look at him the wrong way and it's like the most unpredictable character in the entire series so i think that like manjima is one of like I, I see why people are so like almost like obsessed and like such a big fandom over this character mm -hmm. um because it's just like that like that personality just you know naturally attract like fandoms on like all across like i don't know the globe i dare say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and different like crowd of people so mm -hmm. when and it did really resonate me when you mentioned that oh the whole fandom thing like oh kiwami crowd but <laughs> failed to realize that what kind of perception different like type of fans would have on majima as a character in a series as a whole as well mm. yeah for sure because it's like now that i played all the games like like you were saying i was like thinking too like what if i just started with Yakuza 1 or Yakuza Kiwami, and then now I deal with, like, this Majima character who really was just made to just annoy you, like, annoy character, like, annoy Kiryu, annoy you as a player kind of thing. But then, like, hitting zero, you're like, well, there's, like, a lot, lot more about this character. Um, Yakuza 4, I think, is, like, the first instance where, like, Majima actually gets some sort of, like, backstory and characterization. Um, but yeah, so like it just all ties into like, you know, the experiences can be different for everyone and you know It really Like using terms such as the Kiwami crowd it ties into a sense of elitism and shaming new fans And why why the sentiment could be growing is maybe because of the uncommon argument of like what makes a true fan Like is a true fan playing every single game or so? Um, so like, this goes into the big issue related to gatekeeping, and I already shared how Zero through Kiwami 2 are recent remakes that sold quite well, but they're also the only games that are currently on Steam. So the games 3 through 6 cannot be played uh, by those who don't have any other consoles. And, you know, gamers could also just simply choose to not play certain games as well. Um, and, you know, there, there are many different factors to that. So, saying things like, you only like it because it's popular now, or you only played this game to jump on the bandwagon, but isn't the bandwagon sometimes what a fandom needs to get more content that they love? Because Yakuza is hitting the top bestsellers and award nominations left and right. So it's no surprise there are so many new fans. And then more fans means more and or faster localization. So I noticed that uh, in years of fandom, it's uh, in my years of fandom, it's common that when a series comes before mainstream, there's a sort of sense of superiority over others, which could usually be seen in statements like, I was here before it was cool. And currently, we're now waiting the release of Like a Dragon, or fanonly called Yakuza 7. It'll be released November 10. Uh, this is the fastest localization has gotten, mm. indicating that the series is at its peak. So, Like a, like a Dragon released in Japan in January 2020. And the success of Zero through Kiwami 2 have definitely shown Sega that the interest in the series is building. So now talking about Like a Dragon, um, I'll talk about the infamous dub versus sub debate, and with this game comes an optional English dub. Uh, on social media, and not uncommon to just the series, many players are expressing disinterest and even hatred towards the English dub right now. Uh, one big issue with this is that it's optional, and having this option is all about accessibility. Uh, not everyone can enjoy the game by having to read every line of dialogue because they physically just can't, or they just simply don't want to. 
And I'd like to actually bring up a recently revealed character in Like a Dragon, which is Junki Han. Uh, Scott uh, Street Chart, known as Trigger Red on Twitter, and he is also basically, uh, he names himself the Patriarch of the Yakuza series localization family. <laughs> he shared a tweet about the English VA that they chose for Junki Han. He says, at the heart of this casting was a desire to find an English, vo English voice actor who'd capture that silver-tongued loftiness while giving authenticity to Korean words like Jumi Ju. Uh, or Gumi, Gumi Ju. Uh, happy to report that Jun Gi Han's couple of Korean lines are intact in the dub, and that's thanks to Song Sim, who is the voice actor. So I'd like to say that Like a Dragon localization team has been working their butts off to make this game as polished as it can, English dub or not. And of course, you could choose between dual Japanese and English voice. But specifically related to Jun Gi Han with the English dub, it gives us space for a Korean voice actor to voice a Korean character. Mm. Like Scott said, a more authentic take on the character. So this kind of representation can be empowering to some here on the West and also indicate that there are more opportunities that are opening for underrepresented groups. Thus, even the change in the dub and sub could be a vastly different experience for some fans. So I'd like to say, so let's get rid of this sentiment that everyone should have the same exact experience because that's not how it works in anything really. It's about giving players the ability of choice and accessibility, whether you play sub or dub or easy or hard, there's not really a wrong way to enjoy the content in your way something about creating your space so it's most enjoyable, while also remaining welcoming for people to organically form their opinions and be able to express them. So, yep, that's the beauty of remakes and remasters. In my opinion, new fans means new opinions and new experiences. <laughs> so now I'd like to transfer the topic over to Suzume. <laughs> Thank you, Mae Cream. Um, yeah, so um, thank you so much. I also a huge fan of Yakuza, uh, but also to relate to the um, fandom, uh, I also have another game to talk about, and I believe that this game requires no introductions from the series. So as you can see, that uh, SquareSoft. Um, so it's been a while since they called Squaresoft, now known as Square Enix, and it is a Final Fantasy IX. Um, so basically, um, there's this interaction that I had with Mate Digi um, in one of my previous stream, um, and uh, Mate Digi came in and um, gave a really interesting thought, and basically sparked the entire idea for this panel. So Digi, like, how much experience would you say that you have of Final Fantasy as a series prior to this um, panel? Almost none, or at least like five percent. <laughs> five percent. You said five percent like... experience with Final Fantasy. <laughs> and uh, I think the first one that you played was fifteen. Right. Right. So it was really interesting because one of the first impression uh, they gave uh, they gave me of Final Fantasy Nine is that hey, it looks like Pokemon. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that at the beginning of the panel, you guys have got an impression that uh, Pokemon's Digi's favorite series so at first i admit that i almost fell into the trap of that gatekeeping between like new fans and old fans that cream mentioned previously mm -hmm. uh, like i almost just like want to bad words like you can't catch pokemon in this game but like there's like almost no way like that could have come out in any other way but at least like a little condescending um but like instead i took a moment to like think about it right uh perhaps this is dg's first game outside of 15 which turns to be true and 15 was like very action-packed, chaotic, and stylish. And while 9, it's a very slow pace. Um, it, it's it's very faithful to the root of the series. And I can see like how it can be so like completely unrecognizable and jarring to newcomers of the series. Now, um, Deji, I have another question for you, right? So let us know like what, why did like Pokemon came to your mind when you saw Final Fantasy IX when I was streaming it? I would say it was mostly because of the turn-based um, battle scene. It because Pokemon is also turn-based. So when I saw it, I was just like, "Wait a minute, this is just like Pokemon, but no Pokemon." <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so that was like just basically through the interactions, got, kind of gave me a perspective, right? That I never had for a game that I've loved for quite literally twenty years, and. For me, it was a really beautiful moment because, like, oh wow, like I'm still finding something new about the game after all this time. So, kind of like one thing led to another. I start introducing them to this series uh, 
from the very beginning, right? We, we look at the gameplay and we found more, even more common things between Final Fantasy and Pokemon. Now, maybe I was previously oblivious, uh, oblivious but like this is definitely good, like a new perspective for me, right? Like in Final Fantasy 1, I, I forgot that there was no mana, there's no MP back then. So Magic had charges just like what Pokemon have now. And like how DG mentioned it, how the monsters and players take turn before the time of a uh, active battle system. I think it was implemented in... Don't quote me on this. It was either between 2 or 4. Um, and then we also look at the... Um, that dove like deeper into the artwork, especially Amano's. The un unmistakable like style of his art, right? And even back in the day, it was just so stunning compared to... Like other games, right? Like, like let's say the booklet in the Zelda and the Metroid, like, you know, the box it comes with, it was like mostly very simple, right? But even right from the beginning, Amano's like illustration was so complex and so unique, it just stands out above so many other games in 8-bit era. And then we saw how stunning the graphics were in the 16-bit era, especially Final Fantasy VI. And, and the way the game were able to convey and express more emotions with just like about 24 pixels than some of the Pokemon games these days were also something that like I feel like a lot of us have like taken for granted right mm -hmm. so for us like this like wonderful moment where we have like true perspective that we would have never come into contact with each other like sharing thoughts on something we're like both very passionate about which is video games like, this conversation would ne never happen, right? If I was just, like, right in the beginning, I just dis dismissed them for being like, oh, you're stupid, being ignorant, you never know about Final Fantasy. Like, if I just said that right in the beginning, like, this experience would never come to be. Like, for example, for me, and um, that was a good point where Kareem mentioned that, hey, I don't have a console, but it came to Steam, and that's one of the reasons why I'm able to play Yakuza. So, for Final Fantasy VI, right, I never owned a... Um, Super Famicom or SNES uh, in America and that's why I was never be able to like play Final Fantasy 6 which I know is one of the very best one out there um, and even if I did I couldn't have even understood anything because when I was like living in Hong Kong there was no localizations for Japanese game like in my language and yet I have been like chastised for more than like often than not right for something that just completely out of my control and even Final Fantasy VII, I didn't English, uh, understand English very well back then when the international version came out. Like, I, I just couldn't have understood the story completely. Um, like, all I could do is just interpret it, like, the story with how little English that I understood back in the day. And the music, you know, uh, and also just marvel over its graphic. And that's pretty much my experience over, like, Final Fantasy VII. Yet, another very best one in the series. Now, this is a perspective that is not shared with, like, many of my friends that I've made in America. And at the end of the day, I think, like, this point is very, very personal. But, like, I feel like, how can that be personal to me, right? Like, Final Fantasy is, like, one of the series that reminds me of my childhood. It, it's, it's just, like, very close to my heart, right? Something that I, like, in, in this childhood, it's something that I do not have after I moved to America. Because I moved here when I was a teenager. Right, I remember when I was I was a little kid, I was going through the game with my cousin, like I, I which I've only seen maybe twice in the past 12 years. Like we used to be on the phone, like sharing strategies, like how to beat like certain bosses, like understand the mechanic of the games. And let's say that you disagree with my preference, right? That nine is my favorite Final Fantasy in the franchise. But would you have dismissed me if you knew of the backstory and the reasoning of how passionate I'm about it, right? Right in the beginning, you know, like your favorite can be six, right? Your favorite can be seven, whatever reason could it be, right? It could be, it, it could be any one of them, basically. Like it, it's, with all that being said, right? Nothing brings me closer to home in my heart when I'm sharing my love for the series with Digi and Maid Ruby, who's also a huge fan of Final Fantasy IX, it, it just reminds me of my time with my cousin, right? Like, it, to me, it's also quite poetic in a way because, remember, Final Fantasy originally started as an Eastern take on the Western high fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's got an East meets West, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in the eyes of those gatekeepers, right? 
like, am I inferior because I like it over, let's say, five because of the various job customization? Like, six mm -hmm. with a huge cast of unforgettable characters. Seven with, the, like, the most amazing technical achievement of its time, right? And then we have also, like, A with the iconic gunblade and how you can just break the game with the junk training system in the first hour. Then we have also, like, ten, which pretty much can just make you cry in the first 10 seconds of the song to Xenarchan for those who have completed it or even like the gripping like the mature story of tactics right I mean like my point here is that all the experience and reasoning for what you love is valid it, it they're all valid you have your own reason and I have my own reason and what's really beautiful about it is that if we can come together and sit down instead of like kind of like invalidating each other for what they like you found like all this common ground it, it's often share a much more like beautiful and and long lasting experience down the road mm -hmm. and like finally like i like to say like there are so many excellent stories that i've experienced with recent games that i've played like final fantasy 14 shadow bringers like 13 sentinel mm -hmm. which just recently came out a couple weeks ago yakuza zero Neo automata mm -hmm. i mean like all of which just like made me tear up with like just a whole bunch of emotions or just basically going through a box of tissue like i was <laughs> like shadow Wings literally just made me cry for two hours straight it, it's it's on stream it's not a lie it's not exaggerations i've never <laughs> felt like that before in the video games but it's not <laughs> necessary because like of how sad it was but like they invoke like all sort of emotions deeply within, within the players right and through this experience and like recent events that are happening globally like, there's just like a couple of things that drew into my head, right? It's the importance of compassion and the warmth that comes from understanding each other. Mm -hmm. Like, instead of like alienating other passionate fans and each other, like, why can't we just be the heroes of the story from the fair games that we aspire to be, mm -hmm. right? I really am a deep believer that the best moments in video games like rarely happen when you keep them to yourself, right? So, because, like, at the end of the day, you're not alone. So, yeah, that's, um, no. that's a, yeah, it's a very <laughs> personal point. But, um, but I hope that it also bring my message across. Why I feel mm -hmm. like gatekeeping is just something that is just so harmful to any gaming community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love that though. It's like, yeah, we're yeah, all connected. That so That's sweet. why we're all here in the May Cafe. Like, we're all gamers here. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'd love to basically, I guess, conclude on that as well. You know, like, really, like, Ooh, the beauty of fandom is the fact yeah. that, like, whenever a series can provide so many different experiences and perspectives and attract a variety of people it's evidence that it's so beloved and you know like like you said it does like your experiences differ from mine and in it and in the end we're all here to be entertained and experience something for ourselves and through fandom we can find people that connect with us and how and like connect with us like we connect with the game and then we can curate those spaces like from there you know so it's just as long as the series remains memorable uh there always be new conversations and relationships to spark yeah so <laughs> that's my conclusion as well um do you guys have any thoughts on that too uh my, my takeaway is pretty similar to yours like just like yeah mm -hmm. like online it can be really easy to forget that there's another human on the other side of the screen so we, we should all we should all try to remember that hey like the other person on the other end of the screen has their own unique experiences and story as well we should always try to have conversations and connect with people as individuals mm -hmm. Remember to follow us um, on our Instagram and also our Twitch channel. Like uh, we have a relatively steady schedule. We're trying to streams about two to three times a week, um, rotating from between different mates. And right now, the Spooktober stream is on, so we will screen um, screen. the Scream stream. So we will release the schedule. Uh, I think on a week by week basis, right? Because we have mm -hmm. a new schedule for the upcoming week. Um, yeah, and we yeah. have one more stream for this coming week also. Right, so like we're pretty much trying to like keep in touch with our fans as often as possible. And eventually uh, we'll open up uh, again our public Discord channel. 
so that we'll also keep in touch with everybody during this trying time where we can only see each other faces through cameras. <laughs> yeah, we play Among Us and stuff. <laughs> yes, yesterday we did play yeah. Among Us. Yeah. Um, and then if you guys want to yell at us in the chat anytime about anything that we like, we talked about today, or even more, then yeah, totally hit us up on our Discord. <laughs> Slide through for memes. <laughs> and thank yeah. you so much for being here with us today. It was really, really exciting yep. to talk about like such a topic that we're so passionate about. <laughs> so, yeah, and we'll leave you with a blessing for you all because that's what May Cafes do. <laughs> all right, ready, guys? Okay. Yes. All right. Pixel, Pixel pop, pop power, power up. 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 <laughs> all right. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you so guys. Much. Thank Bye you. Bye now. Stay hydrated.